I I know Ronnie Woo Woo. I've been with Ronnie Woo Woo. Uh, I've had Jello shots with Ronnie Woo Woo. I've watched him dance with relatives of mine. Uh, he is uh, he's legendary. <laughs> well, and he, the, cer- I, he certainly is. But he was booed by Sox fans. I know oh, that much. The idea that he came to the game and was walking around the season ticket holders, I thought was savage. I thought it was absolutely <laughs> savage. <laughs> Do not be alarmed. It's just a couple of guys. Who are these guys? Ray Regina, the left former mayor of St. Charles, lifetime educator, and Pat Crimmins, a Geneva lawyer, but he's actually okay. From Elgin to Aurora, from Naperville to Elburn, these guys are going to talk everything. So... Here's Pat and Ray. Hello, friends, and welcome to another edition of Just a Couple of Guys with your host, Ray Rogina and Pat Crimmins, where we talk everything. Today, we are extremely honored to have a great actor-comedian, Jim Belushi, joining us for some conversation. Jim is in town with his board of comedy, a 100% improv show and that'll be performed at the newly restored Displays Theater in Displays, Illinois, this Friday, April 15th at 7 o'clock. Pat, uh, quick, quick turnaround from last night. We uh, watched, went to the Sox game yesterday, had a wonderful time, and uh, then got back home here and had some refreshments. But uh, I want to just say to you that I really appreciate the fact that uh, at the Sox game, you rooted for the Sox. It was a very uh, you know, great win right down to the wire. But knowing that you're a Cub fan, uh, I had to put up with uh, you giving me a bunch of uh, updated scores on the Cubs and their 2-1 to one victory in Pittsburgh. But I think the, the, the most important moment for you, I think, was when Ronnie Wu walked down the aisle and uh, you were, I think, really wanting desperately to go get a picture with them. But you didn't do it. Can you tell me why? Well, the only reason I wanted a picture, Ray, was because of the podcast. You know, I serve the podcast. It's not really about myself, but uh, I I know Ronnie Woo Woo. I've been with Ronnie Woo Woo. Uh, I've had jello shots with Ronnie Woo Woo. I've watched him dance with relatives of mine. Uh, he is uh, he's legendary. <laughs> well, I mean, he, I, cer- he certainly is. But he was booed by Sox fans. I oh, know that much. The idea that he came to the game and was walking around the season ticket holders, I thought was savage. I thought it was absolutely <laughs> savage. <laughs> and spe- speaking of comedy, and Jim's going to join us here in a bit, I was thinking that perhaps we could talk just for a few minutes about our favorite comedians of all time. Uh, I know you have some. We've I've watched uh, comedy for a long, long time, longer than you. But the fact is, we both enjoy comedy and and uh, have our favorites. Who are some of your favorite comedians? Well, I, I don't think that, um, you know, you can have this discussion without talking about Jerry Seinfeld. I think he changed comedy. Uh, people used to say that I was uh, I was Jerry Seinfeld before there was a Jerry Seinfeld. So I have a I have a kinship with him. All right. uh, I have a, a keen ability to observe uh, things. So, but you know the classics: Richard Pryor, Don Rickles. I enjoyed those guys. But uh, today, probably uh, Chris Rock, uh, Bill Barr. Uh, Norm McDonald, the late Norm McDonald. I, I loved uh, David Letterman, of course. Jim Gaffigan. Uh, I don't know if you know this guy, Sebastian Maniscalco. Uh, uh, I have heard of him. I have. Oh. I have met. I have not seen his performance, but I have heard of him. Absolutely uh, kills me. Uh, you have to watch him too because his his gestures and facial expressions are worth it. Uh, and then Louis Black, of course. So. These are the guys that I find funny. These are the guys that make me laugh out loud. And, uh, um, you know, we're in a different era now. It used to be we would see stand-up every five minutes on TV. I don't see that so much, but I do see uh, some longer videos and and classic videos from these guys on TikTok and Twitter. Some some of the individuals you mentioned I certainly like as well. Uh, And you mentioned rock, and uh, I really enjoy his comedy, but uh, I think that I – admire him a lot because he can switch to a drama role 
real quickly, and that was exemplified in the Fargo series. He did a wonderful job in Fargo in a, in a drama role. Of course, I don't think you can talk about comedy without throwing uh, um, many of the Saturday Night Live graduates into the scene. Uh, obviously, uh, our guest brother, John Belushi, was there. And I liked Eddie Murphy a lot. Um, he was he always makes me laugh. I mean, just always makes me laugh. Uh, and I know you do not like particularly like her, but I find Amy Schumer to be funny. And uh, at the end of the day, though, if I had to point to two people that exemplify comedy for me going over all these years, I go back on the uh, female side. There was none other than Lucille Ball. And I love Lucy. And uh, she made America happy during the 50s uh, uh, every every Tuesday night or whatever night of the week it was. Uh, and and she was just uh, uh, tremendous. And Jackie Gleason, the great one, always stands out for me. The number of characters he played, particularly Ralph Cramden in The Honeymooners, just uh, always, always had uh, had me in stitches. My wife always talks about the fact that Ralph Cramden was uh she said, you know, a serial abuser. And I always responded by saying, you know, I know he went crazy and yelled and screamed and all the time. But at the end of the day, Alice Cramden in that Honeymooner series, she ruled that household. And he was nothing but a simple pussycat who was in love with his wife. So yeah. I, I and, and then Gleason, of course, just like Chris Rock, could switch quickly. And his role in The Hustler opposite uh, Paul Newman, where he played Minnesota Fats and did all the pool shots himself. Uh, I just can't say enough about that. So in comedy, those two stand out. But I think the ones that you listed certainly are uh, are, are, are great as well. Yeah, I you know, I do not find Amy Schumer funny, and I have never found Amy Schumer funny. Uh, I understand that she's related to the majority leader, uh, but um, and there's been allegations that she's taken material from other people, but uh, I just don't find her uh, humorous at all. Now, you want to talk female uh, comedians, uh, Tina Fey, oh, of yes. course, and Amy Poehler, uh, you know, from uh, uh, the, the uh, show with Rob Lowe there. Uh, fantastic comedians. Uh, absolutely hilarious. Uh, Saturday Night Live. All right. Well, anyway, uh, now that you've heard a little bit about uh, art, likes, and comedy, we're going to bring a, a, a good comedian to the forefront here in a few minutes, and we'll be right back with Jim Belushi. Stay tuned. Hello, friends. This is Ray Rogina. I want to take a moment to let you know a secret about my good friend, Bob Karras, and his rookie restaurants around the Fox Valley. The summer heat has made Bob crazy. At all six locations, he's offering his August Inflation Buster special with hot dogs and hamburgers costing only a dollar a piece. Imagine a buck for Rookie's delicious hamburgers and hot dogs. Now, toppings cost a little extra, but still, it's an amazing deal at an amazing place. But it's only available in August, so beat the inflation blues and head over to Rookies with locations in Elgin, Geneva, Hoffman Estates, Huntley, Roselle, and St. Charles. Rookies.com. I'll see you there. At McNally Heating and Cooling, we understand that customer satisfaction starts with arriving at your home on time. Your service technician will apply the same attention to detail and quality workmanship to every job, large or small. We offer upfront, honest pricing, and we'll make sure the job gets done right from start to finish. From furnace and air conditioning service, minor repairs, or total equipment replacement, we do it all. Give us a call or find us online and let the luck of the Irish work for you. Yes, we're here with uh, James Jim Belushi, a uh, noted uh, film actor, TV actor, uh, musician, farmer. Uh, his Twitter feed says he's a father, an actor, and a farmer. 
Um, and we're very excited to have him here today. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're here to talk about is uh, Jim's show, which is on Friday, April 15th, at the Displains Theater. It's at 7 p.m. More information can be had at www.displainstheater.com. That's at 1476 Minor Street, Displains, Illinois, and the number there is 630-962-962. 7,000. Uh, what do you think about the idea of doing comedy on Good Friday, Jim? Well, first of all, I got to thank you. It's nice to be here. And I got to thank you for your introduction because you actually did it right, being a Gemini that I am. And that is, uh, okay. we have here uh, James Jim Belushi. And, I, uh, you know, my professional name is James Belushi. My birth name is James Belushi, but I've always been called Jim. And then but all my movies, all the credits read James. And then on Saturday Night Live, they couldn't fit James and Belushi in the, the card, right? So they said, come on, do you mind if we use Jim? And then, okay, now it's Jim Belushi. So when I do comedy, it's Jim Belushi. And when I do movies and drama, it's James Belushi. So thank you for that perfect introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, we're here to talk about all those things, and uh, uh, we're very excited about it. Um, so, Good Friday. So, uh, let, yeah, Good Friday. Yeah. The, uh, his, yeah. Historically, a, a difficult day. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, because of all the COVID stuff, we had to move the show. And, uh, you know, I love Jesus, so I will honor him through the whole show. Jim, you were talking about how much fun you guys have at the improvs. You say it's less of a show and more of a party. Well, it is because, you know, it's not like I don't do stand-up comedy. I'm, I'm very respectful to stand-up comics because they're quite brilliant. Uh, I I do improvisation like I used to do at Second City in Chicago. And you know all the great talent that came out of Second City, including my brother John, Bill Murray, Chris Farley, Tina Fey. I mean, it goes on and on. That training is incredible. So Larry Joe Campbell, who was on According to Jim with me, and Josh Funk, who's from Chicago, was at Second City. Larry was at Second City. Megan Grano, who was at Second City. We all got together, and we just have a ball. And we improvise. We make stuff up on the spot in front of the audience. So what you're going to see is a one-time only thing. And it's like magic. And then goes poof into the air, just like magic. And the audience is involved, right? Well, with improvisation, we are as good as the audience. So you better be good. Right. Uh, but yeah, we take all our suggestions from the audience and we start making up scenes and we've had 11 standing ovations in a row. If people leave feeling so good, I mean, we're going up to Wisconsin tonight and it's our fourth appearance uh, at the grand theater in Wisconsin because they've just had such a good time with us and we've had a good time with them. And I know coming to this plains, coming back to the Chicago metropolitan area that we're going to have a ball on Friday night. Yeah. Well, you know, when I look at you, Jim, and I take this as a compliment, you know, I uh, I see you and I smell Portillo's beef. You know, you are Chicago. You are the the face of Chicago. And and Ray and I were at Sox Park yesterday for opening day and we saw a lot of Belushi's out there. Everybody kind of looked like you. Our friend said nobody's getting any plumbing done today. I mean, that's that's Chicago, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I know Dick Portillo very well. And I still get a free beef once in a while. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I just say, Dick, well, you know what? They sent me and they look at me and then I point at the picture that's on the wall. I go, okay. I get a free beef. Yes. Hey, yes. Hey, Jim, this is Ray. And uh, I just want to ask you a question. You mentioned Second City uh, and you were there in the late 70s about the time that your uh, late brother John was doing Animal House and subsequently the Blues Brothers, in addition to Saturday Night Live. I'd like you to tell our audience the influence those events had on your successful career moving forward. Those events uh, had an influence on our family. I mean, you know, we were middle class, lower middle class family. And for John to hit that kind of stardom, 
uh, just gave us such a great feeling that, you know, we belong and we feel good. I mean, you know, we were just so, I, the word is overwhelming. I don't even know what the word is. It was just so beautiful. What it did for me was, I mean, you know, there's an old saying that I have, when you drink the water, remember the men or women who dug the well. And John dug the well for my family, for Second City, for Saturday Night Live. He was a leader in all of that. And the Blues Brothers, by the way, so first music videos. That movie was a series of music videos way before MTV. I mean, he was a very innovative leader. And when I was 16 and I came to Second City and saw John, Joe Flaherty, Jim Fisher, Eugene Ross Lemmy, and Brian Doyle Murray, it was like I experienced magic. Improvisation is magic. And I said, John, how do I do this? And that, you know, again, he led me to where I am today. So everything he did had an influence on what I'm doing and where I'm going. So it sounds to me like your influence now has gone to your son. It, it, am I correct? Richard's and also an actor? Uh, I got three children. Robert. Uh, Robert was an actor and lives in L.A. My son Jared's at uh, NYU in the, in the Tisch School studying acting. And my daughter graduated last year uh, studying acting from NYU. And she's at Nashville writing songs and she's doing a podcast. And she's auditioning for movies. And I don't know why all of them went into this profession. Maybe, <laughs> maybe they knew the only way to talk to me was if they were actors because i was working all the time maybe i don't know but it's quite beautiful but it's very like yesterday my daughter had an audition and she called me she goes i'm terrible i'm terrible i'm a terrible actress <laughs> and i said i've told you that for years sonny <laughs> i said please you would make the best cocktail waitress you would be really great you know in the pr you could get out of the profession <laughs> we'll segue into Saturday Night Live. I know you were there for a couple of years. Uh, what uh, cast members did you work with? I worked with uh, Eddie Murphy, Piscopo, Billy Crystal, Marty Short, Christopher Guest, Tim Kazarinski, Mary Gross, Gary Kroger, Rich Hall. And that's a strong comedy lineup. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, uh, Dreyfus's husband, right, Hall? So that was a good cast. You guys had a good run there. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, you know, Lauren Michaels had left Saturday Night Live basically when everybody left, the Andy and everybody. And then Gene Domanian took it over, who was working there at the time. And she didn't quite pull it together. She had a good heart and good wishes and tried hard. And then Dick Ebersol came in and kind of saved the day. And that was the group I was in. Yeah. And then Lauren good took group. over again. And got rid of everybody. <laughs> Started over. <laughs> Typical Lawrence style. Is that is that fair? He wanted to build his own company. One of the guys you mentioned, uh, Tim Kazarinski, I think, wrote about last night. Yeah. Another he did a movie. Great job. Oh, my God. Well, you know, the play, uh, Sexual Perversity in Chicago, was a David Mamet play that was written in Chicago for Chicago. And um, it was a 60 minute play that I did at the Apollo Theater for. Jason Brett and Stuart Oaken, and it was a hit. And then I was kind of hot in TV, and Paramount wanted to make the movie. So Jason and Stuart hired Denise DeClue and Tim Kazarinski to write it. But my point is that the play was 60 minutes, and the movie was, a, was an hour 50. So Denise and Tim did a unbelievable job of adaptation. I thought they should have been nominated for adaptation. That's oh, a wonderful movie. Uh, you got a little softball in there. You got a little uh, mothers uh, in a buddy picture type thing with Rob Lowe. And uh, uh, I thought it was fantastic. I, th I think it really portrays life in the city at that time. And, and you know, it still holds up about relationships, about commitment, yeah. about pressures from your friends not leaving their group into a relationship because everything changes. I think it's very funny. My character, by the way, 
have the most of the original Mammoth dialogue. Well, then you had the long uh, run of the TV show, according to Jim. You enjoyed that experience? That was the best gig, man. I mean, that was eight years of uh, a new family. We got along great. We had so much fun doing it because Larry, Joe Campbell, who's in the show Friday night with me, uh, played my brother-in-law in that. And him and I had a communication a connection that was the best partner I've ever had. And it was so easy to be funny with him. And I mean, for me, when we do this improv show, he steals the show. He's so damn funny. I felt he, he stole according to Jim too. I think he was the funny, he's the true star. And according to Jim, I would sit back and watch this guy. He was so funny. I think you could see the chemistry between you guys on, on the screen. Oh, yeah. No doubt about it. Oh, yeah. We have such a partnership. It's so beautiful and so deep. And we just smile at each other through our eyes more on stage together. We're so happy to be together. That's the thing about the show. When you come in, you may be, you know, it's the end of a long week and you may be tired. You may be snipping and snapping with your partner, your wife, your girlfriend, and you come to this show and we will change your whole physical attributes. Your mental <laughs> stability, it will be filled with endorphins from laughing so hard. You will leave with your head up. Honest to God, it's so fun. Well, I think we're going to take a break, but after the break, we're going to talk about Growing Belushi, your show uh, that's on Discovery Channel. Um, we're going to talk about your opinion that uh, cannabis has medicinal uh, properties. You have a pinned tweet that I wanted to read uh, to the people just founding, finding out that I became a cannabis farmer. I have this to say, if my brother John was a pothead, he'd still be with us today. I got into cannabis because I believe in the medicine and I believe it can help me heal my traumas. That's the quote mission from God. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, the prisoners project. Uh, I'm a former prosecutor, so I'd like to talk to you about that. But right now, let's take a break. Hello, friends. This is Ray Rogina. Break out your inner adventure with a trip to St. Charles, Illinois. Explore the vast culinary options with diverse and stellar restaurants that deliver on quality and service. Take the self-guided St. Charles Brewery Tour, where you'll find a new world of craft beer flavors and experiences awaiting you. Travel down natural walkways, trails, and even the Fox River on a riverboat or kayak. Make memories at all the fun places for activity, shopping, and recreation. It's time for an adventure. Visit stcalliance.org to start yours today. Ray, uh, I want to talk to you a bit about your newest endeavor, the cultivation of marijuana in beautiful Southern Oregon. But first of all, given your performance on Friday in the Plains at a restored historic theater, how about talking to us about your efforts in Medford, Oregon, and the restoration of the Holly Theater? Oh, my God. You know what? This gentleman did such a great job at the Plains Theater. I mean, I, oh, I've been in it. I walked in it and I want Mike. I don't know where he got the money to do it, but it is pristine. It's going to be the best theater that I think our group has performed in. It's got great acoustics. It's got a beautiful, beautiful lobby with a little craft beer bar, some food, a little Mario's kitchen next to it. I can't wait to perform there. He did a great job. And so I'm doing the same thing in Medford, Oregon, trying to take an old movie theater, the Holly Theater, and trying to restore that into a place where we can bring in bands, we can bring in plays. So, but it's, you know, it's a long, hard road. Well, speaking of uh, Southern Oregon and Medford, uh, your farm is at Eagle Point along the Rogue River down in Southern Oregon. I visited Southern Oregon myself last summer, and 
It was near Crater Lake. And I was on I was on guard for the devastating fires. So I'm going to ask this question. What impact do those fires have on your ranch? Well, you know, last year was, was not bad. The year before, it came about three miles from our ranch. And we had the hoses out there wetting down, you know, the house and the grass on the property to try to keep moisture there. It was uh, very smoky. Uh, very hard on people, and a lot of people lost a lot of homes. Yeah. Now, as Pat said earlier, you've got this reality show on the Discovery Channel that talks about your cultivation business called Growing Belushi. Tell us about the show and the business. I try to bring everything I've learned to everything I'm doing, and so I really started by accident. I got this beautiful place in the river, and the farm came up behind me, and, and I bought it, and I didn't know what to do with it. And Danny Ackroyd turned me on to Captain Jack, who used to be the weed dealer on SNL in his 70s. And we started growing this Captain Jack strain, and it just started from there. All of a sudden, once I started farming, cannabis because it was legal in Oregon. I thought it was the new agriculture. I didn't want to grow hay and cattle. I thought were you know too much maintenance for me. And these this feminized cannabis plant is a beautiful spiritual plant medicine. And I've just been kind of going along with it. It's kind of leading me to a whole new knowledge and education about not only the world that cannabis can affect, but also my life. I've grown as a man. That's why I call it growing Belushi. It's not, it's a kind of a pun on growing cannabis, which no one's seen, but it's also me growing as a man. And I've been doing it alongside this plant. I'm not a big user. I'm not like a pothead. I like microdose. I mean, I do like little pieces of chocolate to sleep. I'll do a little, a little teeny hit of something when I have high anxiety. I mean, the truth is, I don't take Ambien, Xanax, even Advil anymore. Cannabis has kind of replaced it. So uh, I really, I, I've been on the road. I've been in dispensaries. I've met with veterans. I, I've met with people who had broken bones from car accidents that were on opiates. And went to CBD, then CB one to one CBD and THC, and got off of opiates. And every county that there is a dispensary, and the opiate overdoses have dropped twenty five percent. And with John dying of a you know opiate overdose, I went, yeah, this this has some purpose. That's what I mean. If John was a pothead, he he would be alive today. You know, you give you give perspective about the use of marijuana. I want to give you some backdrop here. Uh, I'm, I'm an educator by trade, and I was the two term mayor of St. Charles. And and during that time, I had to break a tie by the city council on the approval of a recreational marijuana facility in St. Charles. Our community was clearly divided, probably not unlike your hometown of Wheaton, Naperville, and the like. And I I'd like you to expand upon this point about from your perspective. The, uh, the medicinal, the recreational benefits of marijuana in all of its forms. You talk about uh, prevention of, uh, or reduction in nervousness, anxiety, sleeplessness. Talk to us about well, that. Well, uh, you know, here, here it is. I mean, you know, the wellness of cannabis and the pathway to healing is incredible. The pathway to healing of Alzheimer's, from Alzheimer's rage. I, somebody sent me a picture of this guy who's 72 years old and his arms were black and blue. And I said, what the hell? And he said, that's from three people restraining him from an Alzheimer's rage. I said, give him a candy bar. And they started giving him chocolate that had THC in it and everything calmed down. His rage has calmed down. He's, the last thing I said was, you sit in the backyard in a lawn chair whistling with the birds and there were children in there, and they got scared. So the wellness of cannabis is not only for Alzheimer's, dementia, seizures, epileptic seizures, CBD, just 
from 40 a day to three in six months. Um, this, this sleeplessness, which is what I use it for. Hopelessness. It helps with depression, anxiety, uh, back pain. Uh, they're doing all kinds of studies with MS, cancer, uh, people on chemo. It, it's like my stepfather-in-law, uh, during his later weeks in life, they just filled him with morphine. And he couldn't see us. We couldn't communicate with him. And I said to my mother-in-law, I said, give him a candy bar. And she took him, gave him a candy bar. And he was loaded for sure. But his eyes sparkled and he could communicate with us. So I'm like, geez, you know, in a hospice, this would be a beautiful thing. There's no overdose in it. I mean, if you overdose, you fall asleep. It's okay with your liver. It's just a plant medicine. It's organic in nature. If you get it from a registered dispensary because of the testing that's involved, which I explain on my show, how did they test? It also makes you feel good. There's nothing wrong with feeling good. It enlightens you. It makes you lighter. And then you and you get closer to the light, and you become more generous, uh, more empathetic, more compassionate. I mean, I always say, you know, I was a bouncer here in Chicago, and I never broke up a fight between two potheads. It's a <laughs> useful medicine because everybody reaches for a medicine. Everybody is struggling. We all know somebody who's struggling in life right now whether it's from a PTSD, nervousness, anxiety, whether it's from pain, whether it's from sleep. We all know somebody. It could be our own parents that are having dementia. So what do we do? We reach for medicine. The most runnable of medicine is alcohol. And we know what that does. That, I mean, I have a couple beers now and then a glass of wine, but that destroys families. That kills people. I met someone the other day, actually, oddly, a pharmacist who lost his brother to a drunk driver. His life has changed. And he's got trauma. Well, so we have Valium, Xanax, Lithium, Zoloft. We have all kinds of pharmaceutical medicines that we reach for. All I'm saying is maybe cannabis you should experiment with. On that point, Jim, uh, 16 states, including, of course, Oregon and D.C., have uh, legalized uh, marijuana. But the federal government, as you know, still prohibits the transportation of marijuana across state lines. Do you personally see that uh, changing anytime soon? Well, first of all, there's 37 states that have some form of legalization, medical. or but it, Medical. OK. Yeah. So, you know, that's more than half. OK. Uh, do I see it changing where you can bring cannabis across state lines? Not really, because now the states, for instance, Colorado is a perfect example, has felt the full benefit of a legalized state. When you drive down the road, the highway in Denver, I was with someone. I said, well, what's that? And, oh, that's a fire station. Wow, that's nice. Yeah, it's brand new cannabis. What's that? Oh, that's a high school. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, brand new cannabis. States are starting to realize that this can help with their deficits, help with all kinds of public help from schools to uh, medications, the hopeless, hopelessness or homelessness. And I don't think they're going to want to give that money up by having my marijuana, my cannabis from Oregon being sold in their state because Oregon is the great state of cannabis. Northern California and Southern Oregon is Napa. And literally the parallel between Napa and where I am, if you go across the United States, it's right in the Corn Belt and you go all the way and it's the same parallel as Burgundy and Bordeaux. So on Sunday when God was done with the earth and he started walking he dragged his finger along that parallel and there's magic in that soil and air and wind 
and water. So I don't think states want to give, I don't want, I, I think states want to grow their own to tax it. They tax the cultivator, they tax the distributor, they tax the dispensary, they tax the consumer. And they just get so much money. By the way, which is a problem because of that taxation has raised the price of cannabis and people are now going back to their old pot dealers because it's cheaper and that stuff is not tested. You don't know what kind of pesticides they use to uh, cultivate that. And again, at Growing Belushi, I show, I show the cleanliness and the farming aspect of this marvelous plant. And I'm trying to build confidence in cannabis within people in my age group, people who are afraid of it because it's really nothing to be afraid of. Now, there's people that smoke too much, but there's people that drink too much. But the people who smoke too much pass out. People who drink too much get in cars. I think the great fear of cannabis is the smell. Uh, can you get your botanist together and get rid of that well, skunk uh, smell? Yeah, there's, I mean, look, there's no smell in a candy bar. There's no smell in tinctures. There's no smell in gummies. There's no smell in vape pens. Um, you know, those little vape pens, we used to call them mama's helpers. Because they put them in their <laughs> purse, take these kids to soccer practice, take one little hit, calm down, because the six kids are going to get in the car. They're functional. It's very clear. Um, you know. It, well, before we let you, before we let you go, Jim, uh, I did I did want to talk. You're quite the advocate uh, for cannabis, and um, I did want to talk a little bit about that prisoners project. Um, there are how many thousands of uh, people in custody 40, incarcerated? Because forty thousand. 40, and what is the prisoners incarcerated for nonviolent cannabis crimes? And what is the Prisoners Project? Uh, what's their goal? It's, it's as really it one it. simple goal. Get them out. Time to get them out. And how? Time to release them. <laughs> we got Richard Delisi out of Florida. He was in for 32 years. No guns, no hard drugs, cannabis. And, you know, there's so many men that were trying to make a living, you know, trying to feed their families. Yeah. The truth is... Well, Most people have families. The number one fear in life is death. The number two fear in life is the collapse of family. And those families collapsed. And that's PTSD. And that poor guy sitting in the cell, in the cell selling three pounds of marijuana to make money for feed his family, too. Uh, it's enough. He's been in long enough. Let's let him go and let's help him get back to his family and society. Well, let's get back to uh, Friday, uh, Friday, April 15th, Friday, Friday. April 15th, seven o'clock, uh, the Displains Theater. Again, that phone number is 630-962-7000. And of course, you can uh, buy tickets online at Uh Jim, on behalf of everybody, we appreciate your time uh, and talking to you today. You're a joy. You exude Chicago, uh, and you'll always I be. I the seventh inning stretch the other day. That was so fun. Yes, I heard that, and I, and it was actually good. Well, thank you. <laughs> we, Jim, uh, we, Jim, we didn't talk to <laughs> Jim, I hope you make an appearance at the White Sox games as well at oh, some I point. Oh, I do. I, I have a couple of friends uh, that are Sox fans, and you know, we we razz each other pretty damn good. We have a good time, so we try that's good razzing. So when the White Sox are in the World Series this year and you're there, uh, just just uh, pause your Twitter because you're going to catch a lot of grief. Right? Hey, uh, you know what? I think they really got a pretty good shot. They look pretty good. Uh, Oxman. They do. They do. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. And uh, we're going to take a break at this point in time. Thank you very much, Jim. Thanks for having me. And if, and if you ain't doing nothing on Friday night, come and laugh your ass off with us. With the port- <laughs> Thanks, you. We're going to have a great time. Yes, Thanks, sir. Jim. All right. Prepare 
here to be moved. We are the Fox Valley Auto Group. Both our Volkswagen and Buick GMC dealerships are located here in St. Charles, and we're proud to serve our community. As a recipient of the BBB Torch Award for Ethics, we are dedicated to ensuring quality first, always upholding uncompromised integrity, being customer-focused, and seeking continual improvement. Stop in today or visit our website at foxvalleyautogroup.com. We are back after a, a stimulating conversation with uh, Jim Belushi and Pat. Uh, your thoughts? Well, when you use the word stimulating, uh, no pun intended, uh, he is a passionate advocate for cannabis. And, uh, you know, I've heard him talk in other venues about uh, Steve McMichael and other people who are living with chronic pain and, and their uh, histories with cannabis. And, and he certainly is passionate about it. And I don't think it's because he has a farm and he sells it and he has a TV show. I think he really believes it. And we can't forget that um, he lost his brother. You know, we lost uh, kind of a, a star and an icon, but he lost his brother. So he has to deal with that. And I think this is part of the way that he does that is through this cannabis. So well, I, I really appreciate it when I asked a question about uh, the fact that it is still, despite the fact that, he makes an outline about the, the benefits of uh, both medicinal and recreational marijuana. Uh, the fact that it's still a divisive issue in many communities. And I would be uh, a liar if I didn't say up and down the Fox Valley and into Naperville and, and beyond in the western suburbs, you have uh, people who have their opinion on the subject. My view, and, and I'm, I'm for one going to be very specific here because I brought it up in the in the interview. Uh, my view is that the fact is Illinois has legalized marijuana. So a city can take a position that we don't want it in our neighborhood. We don't want it in our city. Well, that's a wrong position from this perspective. It's going to be in your city. It's going to be in your neighborhood. It's going to be next door. Whether or not you want to benefit from that with the revenues associated with it, as he talked about, is up to you. And so city councils uh, and the populace have to uh, recognize that and, and, and rule accordingly. And so on a personal basis, as a resident of St. Charles, one of the towns that in this area that we, we, we beam our uh, podcast to, I'm very happy as a resident to see that uh, we are receiving the revenue associated with uh, the legalization of marijuana. Um, you know, you know and I can't. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's OK. Go ahead. No. And I, and I don't think we've seen any negativity in terms of uh, societal issues with it. Uh, you know, certainly we smell it wherever we go. But I, I don't think that crime is up or DUIs are up or, or things like that. As uh, Mr. Belushi points out, you know, you, you fall asleep uh, most times. But uh, um, so I, I, I think that that specter of, well, there'll be an increase in crime once it's legalized. That really hasn't happened uh, as far as I know. Well, now, he made an interesting point, uh, and I, I, I captured it, and I hope the, our audience captured it as well, though, too. And it's for, obviously, uh, uh, legislators and elected officials, and that is the taxing of it. Um, you know, it can come to a point where if it's too expensive, as uh, Jim said, we're going to have the pot dealers selling the, the crap, if you will. And, and all along, that's been my position, that if you regulate this product, you get rid of those guys and ladies who deal that stuff on the black market. But uh, the fact of the matter is you haven't been rid of them completely, at least in Jim's eyes, if, in fact, you make the product too expensive. So we, we deal with economics on this all the time as much as anything else. As I used to say in high school in the classes, it's all economics anyway. So, uh, uh, Well, it, there are for the average pot consumer, and I do not claim to be one, uh, there might be uh, quality issues. Uh, there might be uh, more comfort with their drug dealer down the street as opposed to the government. Perhaps people don't want to register at the dispensary. Um, all these things apply. Uh, I think uh, cost obviously is a factor. Uh, there's no doubt about that. 
Well, uh, I thought it was an enlightening interview, and I uh, uh, really appreciated Jim's time today. Before we check out, Pat, I do want to go back to our opening comments and say that, you know, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say that uh, last uh, night after we came back from the Sox game, uh, we were treated to some fine pizza and, and liquid refreshment at Aurelio's in Geneva and our host, Kevin Sarah. And so I want to make sure we shout out to him our thank you for uh, a job well done. I know you seem to be very happy with your pizza. Well, all I can say is uh, it's the sauce. <laughs> That's correct. Well, once again, we, we want to thank Jim Belushi for a wonderful, wonderful conversation. And I am sure that all of you enjoyed it as well. So until next time, this is Ray and Pat, just a couple of guys talking everything and reminding you, as always, to be safe. So long, everyone. 